the power of the system, we've got the mains going into the on off switch. Uh, this is only temporary, but um, it's just for testing purposes. It's actually off the PS2 console, the original fat one. The reason I'm using it that is that it outputs 12 volts at 7 amps, which is just over twice the amount you can get off a GameCube um, adapter. So I'm using it for this system. Just make sure that most systems will. Uh, We'll be trying to draw more power than the system can provide. Seven amps is considerably more than uh, than I require. That in turn feeds over to the regulator boards. Uh, this is off the GameCube because the 1.9 volts is rather important for the GameCube. Um, into banks of 7805 for 5 volts. And there's a 7806 over here to tell the system on the SCART plug to output on 6 volts and therefore go into RGB mode and then there's a bank of other regulators uh, which will be going between minus 5 volts and up to plus 15 volts to drive the various systems for the video and the audio we have these connections the left and right audio the composite which is also for the C-Sync and the RGB. What I'm using for the combined plug which will feed all the systems is what we call in the UK a SCART connection. Um, the French I believe invented it, I think they did, and uh, they called it Paritam. Uh, but basically it's a 21 pin connection, the 21st pin being the grounding, and it's capable of doing a composite, S-video and RGB. Um, it selects between composite and, and the RGB mode by supplying a different voltage. It also does the 4-3 um, the usual uh, format screen and also widescreen too. Uh, obviously the game supports it. So, on the right hand side we have the connections that go straight into the cable and into the television. And on this side we have the generic contact um, for each of the connections to feed into said cable. These connections feed into the bank of switches and you notice we have them set up here so that uh, the common connections like for example all the uh, composite connections will come along one side. And those are all connected from the separate cables from the consoles. So one of the things that the bank of switches will do is to tell it which set of video and audio connections to take um, from which particular console, so only one is live. There's a bank of metal plates, this is actually from shielding. The reason being is that when you're trying to solder a big mass of wires, considering there's going to be 17 consoles here, it's going to need an awful lot of wires and it's very easy when you're soldering for other wires to, to become loose. So what I've done is to use a plate to whereby I'll be attaching anywhere on the plate is fine all the wires that are required for the video and for the various voltages. And as you see I cater from here from 15 volts down to minus 5 volts. It means that I can just connect the various power wires like here for example from the console straight to the plate and it will deliver it power. This brings me very neatly on to these. These are eight uh, pole um, double throw switches. Um, in other words, when you press in or out, it activates eight connections. What I've had to do is to utilize one of these for the controllers, considering a controller wire can have up to nine different connections, one of which is always grounding, which is handy and then I've had to use a second one for the audio video. Um, it's actually taken up pretty well all of the pins. So we have a bank here. So for example if we were working with this console system uh, and it was all wired up, I'm going to make a combined switch but basically you have both of them pushed in and that will tell the system to work from that particular setup. Down here we have two consoles already wired up the GameCube at the bottom and the Amiga CD32 um, as the next one up. 
this has kept all the connections independent um, simply because if they're not there will be conflicts on the boards and things will just not work. Bear in mind these systems are proprietary and uh, even the controllers are not compatible. So that's why we have a big bank of switches. This is just the first set of, uh, of nine here. Uh, there's going to be a total of 17 reaching up to the top and in terms of size okay this is quite tall at the moment this line here represents the height that the entire system will utilize um, the whole thing will be under 35 centimeters tall which considering what's going inside is really quite small this represents the back of the system where of course the scout lead will come out through and on the front will be this bank of switches which will actually be positioned over at the very front over here um, so that on the front left as you see the system will be the, all the switches and also the on off switches for each individual system. On the back of the assembly um, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to use some fairly large computer fans or this large 9 inch fan that I have in order to bring air into the system uh, to keep everything nice and cool um, and at the front well the bottom sections will be three tier with the CD systems and then on the top will be a bank of cartridge ports for the cartridge systems this is purely just a skeleton it's just to provide a bit of strength just a bit of chipboard it will obviously have a nice layer on the outside uh, and on pretty on the front and on the side over here um, across this part and uh, will be painted and look attractive at the moment this is purely to provide strength and internal structure not for looks in case you're wondering over here I put two AA batteries um, watch batteries I was finding didn't last very long I know they should do but for some reason they didn't so that will provide a lifetime's amount of uh, life to access the CDs from the front of the system obviously this needs to be pulled out so how I've designed it just pull the camera back is that when this is pushed forward there's a, a stop on this side here to stop it going any further as you see it goes out pretty well to the end allowing very easy changing of the drives and the cable here um, there's enough flexibility in terms of length so that things don't catch I'll just retract it again obviously you can push it from the front or the back at the moment this is just to illustrate the principles of it working and again we have the stop so it doesn't go back any further than the edge of the system quite ingenious I'm going to put a shelf on each of these so that um, they can move out easily and therefore provide the second layer which will have in this case the PS2 and also the Philips CDI. When you go to more than a few inches worth of cabling you need to use shielded cable. It stops interference on the lines. For example the wire for this controller um, is four meters long. Um, without shielding there would be too much interference it just wouldn't work. The same principle is true with the quality SCART lead inside there is also grounding and on cables that are transmitting video um, over any degree of distance again I've used shielded cable and the same is true for the connections for the audio video uh, going to the switches and also for the controller too exactly for the same reason it means you can get much greater distances This side is for the connections for the controllers. The uh, common connections here, of course, feed back into the female port of a PlayStation connector. Um, I put the male part into the master controller cable uh, up into here so that it is removable and it's also quite attractive, much better than just having a wire sticking out from the main system. Okay, I'm going to show the system uh, working as a demonstration. 
um, to prove that uh, it all works fine. Just turn the television on, mains is plugged in, the back of the uh, controller is loaded with the GameCube. And all I need to do now is to turn the mains on, which puts the television screen onto blank. Switch the console on, which then starts the GameCube. the screen to go through it. Sometimes it keeps the settings, sometimes not. Just like to get, get its way through the system so that we can give a quick demonstration. It's a start button. Bomberman Generation! The reason I like to show this game is that it's the best and the quickest way I've found to show the shoulder buttons working. Amongst everything else. The Great Desert. So, as we say, move around, you can do your bomb, you can kick it, detonate it, do what you like. And I just move this around, make shoulder buttons are also working absolutely fine. And then that's the game. What I'm now going to do it just to flick the switches from the GameCube to the Amiga and change this connector. As I need to use two hands, I'm just going to have to change the connector and then do the rest of it. In the meantime, I'm just going to turn the system off and of course at the mains. Don't need to turn that one off, but it's good practice. I'm back in just a moment. So as mentioned on a previous video, all we have to do is to put the connector into place. I haven't put the blanks for the controllers in place for just for sake of speed. You can now change these switches at the bottom to turn the GameCube off and into Amiga mode. All I have to do now is to turn the system on up here. This is the switch for the on off for the Amiga. And after a couple of seconds, the Amiga starts to spin. And also work in RGB mode. The image is a bit lighter on this, so I'll put in the resistor to make it darker. Again, for the sake of illustration, right, let's skip through the demo. Right, this is a quite a good little game called Sleepwalker. That's the start button. The RGB on this game, if you notice, is slightly over to the right. It might just be because this is an old television. Um, if not, I'll set it into composite mode. But again, it all works rather well. I'm working one-handedly on this. I have to excuse the fact I won't do this particularly well. The object on this one is to move the character up the top. 
Yeah, see, I'm going to have to. <sighs> really is difficult doing this one handed. And there we go. The idea of this game is to help your character get through to the end without waking up. But you get the general idea of how the game works. So I know that the game didn't come out too well from the Amiga from the screen, but the whole point of this video was to illustrate that two completely separate proprietary systems that are not designed to work together are the switches keep all the contacts independent and therefore adding more systems in the same fashion means that uh, you can have as many game consoles connected by this method as you wish to by keeping the grounding separate um, because that turns the system on and off and therefore this principle will work with all the consoles that I wish to incorporate in the system and as the video progress continues um, you'll see more systems working in this configuration.